My name is Amanda Linden, and I'm the design director at uh, Facebook working on profile and search teams. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about designing effective collaboration. So one of the questions that I feel like I get a lot is not how do you collaborate. It's just um, mostly designers notice that their current way of collaborating isn't working for them, and they want to change the organization to collaborate in a new way, and they don't really know how to do that. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of my experiences doing that, uh, specifically with search and profile. For a long time, Facebook collaboration looked like this. This is a, a hack day, but I think it's also kind of a good representation of how I noticed teams working uh, when I joined in general. So here you see um, a bunch of uh, really closely knit teams, each focused on a particular feature or a particular problem. Within your team, you're feeling really tight and close knit. Um, it's very seamless. And in this way, you can create kind of a startup culture even as you grow bigger and bigger. Um, another way to represent that might be it with this expanding diagram where the company went from a startup to a bunch of uh, disparate teams. Um, and it became uh, a world where you measure people on how much they ship, uh, a world where many, many experiments are tested, which is great. Um, and we tended to recognize people on how much they lifted a metric. And this is good in a lot of ways. This is the way that a lot of growth companies work. When you have product market fit, and then you want to um, get more and more users and more and more time spent, this is an ideal way of operating. Um, it means that teams aren't blocked by other teams. It means that you can do lots of uh, experimentation and get quick learnings and iterate very, very quickly. There's low management overhead and a high level of IC empowerment, which is great. Um, and progress towards goals is really straightforward. If you're looking at lifting a metric, if the metric goes up, you're like, great, we did our job today. Um, and we got a lot of good work shipped, got a lot of users around the world, and a lot of growth and engagement and time spent. And today we have over 2 billion users who are all spending a reasonable amount of time on our app. And so times have changed. Um, and this way of working also created a lot of issues in our product experiences. Um, so here's an example of three different ways that we show profile photos in Facebook today. Um, it also created increased complexity. So you have newsfeed, and then you have stories, and then you have the watch tab, and then if you click on more, you see lots of different products that we've created over time. And so each of those individual teams has built and shipped and built and shipped, and now we have a really large and much more complex app than we did. Um, and that causes uh, slowness and performance issues. And so more recently, we've realized that we really needed to change our way of working in order to solve these new challenges. And so how to do that? We wanted to consolidate and simplify, create a more consistent experience, and to empower teams to stop the line and flag something if it isn't working. And if you don't know what stop the line means, there's a, a famous Harvard Business case study where uh, they changed their way of working in the factory system such that any employee in the company could stop the factory floor if they saw something that was wrong. And so we wanted to be able to empower all our employees to do the same thing. Um, and we wanted to also shift from working autonomously and independently to working more collaboratively and cohesively. When I work, uh, and so hopefully over time, our, our teams would actually start to converge and our product experience would reflect that convergence. Um, and when I think about designing a new way of collaborating, I tend to look at it in this way. So starting with a vision, then execution, and then refinement. First, I want to get a sense of, does everyone across the team understand what we're heading toward in the next couple of years? Do they know who we are and who we aren't? Um, and then I want to figure out whether, as we're executing and shipping new features to our product experience, is everything that we're shipping laddering up to that vision, and is it meeting our new quality bar? And then lastly, I want to make sure that we have a process for fixing UI bugs quickly, because inevitably you're going to find pieces in the product or seams between feature teams that need refining. And so first, we embarked on uh, defining our mission and vision. Um, this was at a time where uh, Facebook as a whole was getting a new mission from make the world more open and connected to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. 
And so it was a good time for us to figure out how search and profile laddered up to that overall company mission as well. Uh, for profile, uh, we came together as a team and aligned on the vision of bring people closer together by helping them understand each other better. And underneath that, we wanted to sort of focus in three areas, discovery, understanding, and connecting, helping people discover one another and, and make new relationships on Facebook. When you look at one another's profile, you should be able to have a clear understanding of who this person is and what they like and what their activity is. Um, and then you should have a, an ability to more deeply connect with people on Facebook through their profile. And then on search, we wanted to focus on helping people find and explore anything on Facebook. Um, and we had to frame up the opportunity and the strategy to improve quality, support new and growing use cases, and teach people what Facebook search can do. And then once the vision and uh, mission is set, then you start to think about execution. Um, so one of the first things that we needed to get alignment on is that designers own shipped pixels. Uh, when executives would say, like, you know, why is this happening? How come our quality isn't quite where it needs to be? Um, we'd say, well, you know, there's a lot of engineers who maybe kind of get it close, but not quite all the way there. Or um, maybe designers create mock-ups and then they, you know, do red lines and they feel like they're finished. Um, and so there was a note from our head of product saying, designers own shipped pixels. This is really empowering, but also a, a new level of responsibility for the design team. And so one of the things that the design manager um, that I worked with on search did that I thought was really, really healthy um, was he got all the engineers and all the PMs together in a room uh, and he got some examples of our experience and he showed what was in spec and what was in product. And the differences aren't too stark, but little by little, these differences add up. And then he showed this one Here's what's spec'd and here's what's in product. And it's like just these little differences. Um, you could imagine that if you didn't have the detailed eye, you'd be like, this is good, this is shippable. Um, and then here's as spec'd and in product. But in aggregate, all these little differences really add up to a perceived lower quality product. And so rather than blaming or, or um, trying to mandate a particularly different process, this design manager did a really good thing, which is he just said, why is this happening? And what could we do differently? And pretty quickly, the engineering team started volunteering new ways of working that were really aligned with how the designers wanted to work. So we agreed that all experiments that change the product should be reviewed by a designer. That was really different and very, um, very impactful for both the designers and the engineers. There was a culture where you could you know, do a hackathon and engineers could make something on their own. And now there's the new expectation that yes, you can still make something on your own, but you'll have a designer point of contact that you show it to before it goes into uh, dog fooding. The other thing that we talked about was don't ship even internally until it's built to spec. So one of the hard things that I found as a design manager was I would look at something in dog fooding and I'd think, okay, this doesn't seem right, but it would be hard for me to log a bug because I wouldn't want, I wasn't sure if they're finished, right? And so I didn't want to like jump in the middle while they're halfway through and be like, hey, what's the problem there? Um, and we're a very nice and, and open and uh, friendly culture. And so it became really hard to know whether it was appropriate to log a bug if you weren't sure. And so um, the rule of, hey, if you're even gonna ship this internally, it has to be built to spec means that if you see anything wrong, you know you can stop the line. Um, and then the last one is dog food for a week or more before starting an online test. So you wanna feel it yourself for a little while and start to gather some internal feedback before sending it out. And so then, once, then going into the refinement phase after execution, you're now trying to figure out how can we make sure that we're able to log every bug we need to log. Um, pretty early in the process, I feel like not enough of the design bugs were getting prioritized, and I hear that all the time at a lot of different companies. It's like, yeah, you know, these are always the P3s, and you know, the other bugs are going to get prioritized, but ours probably won't. Um, and so we created um, a search UX hashtag and a profile love hashtag. Uh, if you rage shake and log a bug, 
Um, you can describe it and then associate it with search UX or profile love. And then we have a point of contact on search and a point of contact on profile on the design team that's looking at that long list of bugs and prioritizing them. Um, and we agreed with engineering on what a high pry, a medium pry, and a low pry design bug would be, and then how much time it would take to get a high, medium, and low pry bug fixed. Um, so this was how we rolled out the changes in, in collaboration and process. But what I found is that there was still a lot of hesitation with the team. Um, and when I asked about it and dug in, there was a, a comment around like, yeah, I know, but I just feel like when it comes time for performance reviews, I'm gonna not get a good review if I don't ship something or lift a metric. Um, and then I was like, well, what if I make it completely clear to you that you don't have to <laughs> ship something or lift a metric, you can improve quality and that'll be great. And they're like, yeah, but I feel like even if I believe that, maybe my PM or my engineering partner won't. Um, and so we had to work with our head of engineering and our head of product to define a set of new axes that the entire organization would be measured by. Um, first, the engineering team rolled theirs out, and then um, we mapped the design axes to the engineering axes, and then the PMs did the same thing. Because we wanted to make sure that there was uh, the same expectations being set cross-functionally. And so our design axes are design excellence. You leave the product experience in better shape than you found it. You demonstrate rigor and diligence in your approach to solving quality issues. And you dog food and play with early builds, providing feedback along the way. And then also understanding. Um, your experiments lead to actionable insights regardless of a ship, no ship decision. So this is a big deal. Like you can work really hard on an idea that seems like it's going to make sense and then you test it and it doesn't work out. The right decision is not to ship it. And so we wanted to empower our teams to make that decision. That's okay. Um, you spend the time to get confidence that your idea has some likelihood of success. You use data, research, and prototypes to ground your ideas and deeply understand the problems you are tackling. And you're diligent about using real user data in your designs, and you test with global users. You invest time in understanding that data relates to your design and take the time to investigate surprising results so you can refine the experience. And the next uh, section was around direction. And direction uh, applies more to more senior designers, um, but to a certain extent, all designers as well. So you're able to identify new problems and solidify goals for your design projects together with your cross-functional partners. You open up new areas of inquiry for the team. You're mindful not just of the product experience itself, but also the language and growth tactics used around the product experience. And then the last section was around people. So you help onboard new designers to the team. You are collaborative and constructive in your interactions with your peers, and you actively help break silos. You reach out beyond your immediate team and connect with other teams on shared opportunities and challenges. And so documenting these expectations gave the team a little bit more confidence about, okay, this is how I'm gonna be measured. I can, I can work in this way. Um, and so I think at this point, I would say we are here. We're in the process of converging. We're in the process of learning how to work together with other teams. We're in the process of figuring out how to roll out new pattern libraries as one. Um, and although we see a lot of positive effects in this transition, there are a lot of downsides as well. We're gonna work more slowly. And the team you know, was concerned about that. And we said, slower is okay. Um, it takes a lot of coordination and discussion to move more synchronously as a company, um, and that's taxing. Like, there's a lot more discussions around, like, hey, if we're all going to use the same component, you know, let's pull it together and let's all figure out how to make it work, even though it's not ideal for this team and maybe less ideal for this team, it's going to work better for that team, and let's all do the same thing for our user. Um, and then fewer new things will ship while we're focused on quality. Um, but for now, I feel like the benefits really outweigh the negative effects. Um, I tend to believe that the, the right way to collaborate is to sort of fluctuate between these periods of innovation and periods of convergence, because there's pros and cons to both, and there's no ideal way to collaborate. And so the best approach I feel is to converge until you have something that feels really, really good, and then innovate on top of that, 
and then you're going to find that you've kind of muddied the user experience and then come to convergence again periodically over time. Thank you.